All right, so let's address any questions and concerns that I know probably will arise from this. We'll start off with the simple questions, then we'll get to more advanced topics. Are black holes real? Is anything other than your own mind real? If yes, and if general relativity correctly describes the universe, then yes, black holes are real. Do black holes lead to a parallel universe? No, I already showed where they lead to. Besides, a parallel universe would not resolve the black hole information loss paradox. Because information must be preserved in our universe, it cannot go to a place that's outside of our universe. The other side of the fabric of space-time is still our universe. Do black holes lead to a distant part of the universe, connecting two black holes that you could warp through? No. Why would they do that? Why would two distant places of the universe be causally connected by black holes? Absolutely not. Do black holes contain many universes in them? And this one I kind of get because if you calculate the size of a black hole for all the mass in our universe, apparently it equals 13.7 billion light years in size. And the age of the universe is 13.7 billion years old. So if a light traveled from the center, it would travel 13.7 billion years. But um, I know there's a lot of debate on that in the physics world, but uh, I doubt there's a mini universe inside a black hole. I 100% would bet that there is no such thing as a mini universe inside a black hole. So wait, a black hole doesn't lead to the other side of a bookshelf? Aha, very funny. All right, all right, moving on. All right, so now on to some serious questions. Does this break the equivalence principle? I say no. If I have two objects, as long as they accelerate away from each other, for example, in the presence of the Earth's gravitational field, at 9.8 meters per second squared, then the equivalence principle is held. Furthermore, I think it should be updated to say that objects on the same side of the fabric of space-time would accelerate in one direction and objects on the other side must always necessarily gravitate in the opposite direction. But as long as they're accelerating at the same rate, regardless of the direction, the equivalence principle is not disobeyed. What about the positive mass theorem or the positive energy theorem? Yes, that has been calculated, but since the other side of the fabric of space-time has not been known, I must ask the mathematicians that figured that out, did you also solve it for the other side? Because you might be seeing that on the other side, mass must necessarily be negative. Pretty much that parallel universe that's appearing in the Penrose diagram for the maximally extended Schwarzschild solution. Check in that area. If it's always negative, then once again, I'm right. Is there anything that makes you feel like this theory of yours? And it's not my theory, it's Einstein's theory. I'm just interpreting a part of his theory that was previously uninterpretable. But is there anything about this that maybe makes you think it could be wrong? And almost, the Kretschmann scalar. I'm pretty sure there is a way to reverse that to show that the event horizon of the black hole is the point where the equation misbehaves, resulting in a singularity. That's some pretty high level of mathematics that I'm not capable of. I'm comfortable with calc, but anything above that, and I'm pretty sure Kretschmann scalar is like calc 72, I'm unable to do it. But if you're one of the first people watching this video and you have the mathematical ability to figure that thing out, I suggest you hop on it, because there should be a way to reverse it and take that Kretschmann scalar from the other side and get that the singularity is occurring at the black hole's event horizon. So, that hair on point. Oh yeah, always on point, boy. All right. So the other thing that bother, so the other thing that bothers me is um, positron electron annihilation resulting in two photons. I feel like only one photon should be detected from that. The other one should go to the other side where it's not detected. But I'm not sure how those experiments were conducted. Did they just hit one single electron and positron together and see two photons? Or did they combine a bunch of them and count them? Because if they, let's say, 100 electrons and 100 positrons all combined 
and annihilated and then we only saw 50 photons then the scientists might conclude that okay 50 electrons and 50 positrons collided when in reality it was a hundred so I'm not sure if they were able to count how many annihilations were happening or if they just um, how they were looking at the photons but um still can't rule out that both these photons that there's something special about them when they annihilate from matter and antimatter and that they could be seen on both sides so that doesn't necessarily rule it out just yet now at this point things would get complicated let's say you were able to find some experimental evidence that proved me wrong you would still need to explain why general relativity is predicting everything I've shown. Now, if your reasoning happens to be, yes, general relativity for the regions of negative radius are describing everything you've shown. However, that is not the case for our universe. Then that would be the first time that general relativity was ever proven wrong. Is this not something that should be in a scientific journal to be able to go under peer review? I guess. What's the first biggest mystery? Why we're here? Why is there something rather than nothing? And that is the meaning of life, to figure out why there is something rather than nothing. What separates us from animals? Well, what am I doing right now? I'm asking questions and trying to answer them. Now, what is the final question I could ask if I kept asking a question with a question? Why is there something rather than nothing? And if all animals tend towards a being with a conscious mind, a conscious with free will, that is what all life can maximally become, then I would have to say the meaning of life is to answer the question, why is there something rather than nothing? All right, now I'm just showing off. What are your credentials on this matter? Minor in physics, minor in math, majored in philosophy and that is how I figured this out through philosophical means so if anybody ever asks you what can you do with a degree in philosophy you let them know I could figure out black holes <laughs> also I have my minors in political science if you care to know I don't believe this because I've never heard of this other side of the fabric of space-time don't worry I know you haven't is this video called a review of everything we know about physics so far or black holes solved? It's called black holes solved. I know you've never heard of this other side of the fabric of space time before. Don't worry. Are you the first person to figure out black holes? It would highly appear so. I know uh, Ruggiero Santilli and Massimo Vallada both deserve an honorable mention for coming very close. I know Velada did a charge parity time inversion to the Schwarzschild or to general relativity and concluded that antiparticles live in an inverted space time. I'm not sure if what Massimo realized was that he was seeing two sides of the same metric, but um, I have to say. He definitely came the closest. He also described the region of negative radius within the Kerr metric for a spinning black hole and described that as the region that antiparticles could live in. I'm saying that it's all regions of negative radius within Einstein's general relativity. And not that antimatter lives there, but when matter goes to that negative region, it must necessarily be antimatter. I believe that there's no such thing as matter and antimatter. Well, obviously there is, but I believe that just matter is matter and that depending on which side it is on makes it be matter or antimatter. But uh, One thing for sure, I am definitely the first person to resolve the black hole information loss paradox. And that's really all I care about.
Yeah. Now, Cabolet issued a response to Velada, and it's the paper where he mentions it's like Velada's putting the cart before the horse, and he says that both matter and antimatter would see the same metric. So antimatter couldn't have, couldn't see the metric differently. And I'm saying that, yes, I agree with you, matter and antimatter both see the same metric, but depending on what side of that metric they are on, they would experience the metric differently due to that. That's my response to a response that wasn't directed at me. Hasn't dark matter been shown to have positive gravitational interactions? And that's not necessarily the case. If you have an invisible force acting on something, it could be something and something, imagine a particle moving this way. If the thing that's making that force is invisible, it could be something making the force over here, pulling it this way, or it could be something over here, pushing it this way. Now let's apply this invisible force concept to the galaxy cluster 002417, which is some of the best evidence we have for dark matter. When utilizing a positive gravitational interaction for dark matter, in accordance with the gravitational lensing from the photo, scientists get a distribution for the dark matter as such, in blue. Now instead, if we were to utilize negative gravitational effects for dark matter, then that would place the distribution of dark matter here, in red. Look familiar? Unfortunately, this is a static scenario where not a lot is going on in regards to matter-antimatter annihilation. In order to see that, let's apply the same exact concept to the legendary bullet cluster. So there's a thing in astrophysics where if you got a theory, then you'd better be able to explain the bullet cluster. And once again, this is not my theory. It's Einstein's theory. I'm just the one to interpret a part of it that was previously uninterpretable. And as we'll see, this interpretation explains the bullet cluster. So the bullet cluster is a collision of two galaxy clusters where there is evidence of dark matter due to gravitational lensing, incorrectly shown in purple, and in hot pink is what is incorrectly deduced to be X-ray emissions from collisions of hot gas particles. To get an idea of what is going on in this picture, we'll look at a supercomputer's rendition of the trajectories of the clusters. Now, before I show this, just know that it's incorrect. So the clusters collide and the dark matter goes through unimpeded since the best current understanding of dark matter is that it is akin to magical gravitational fairy dust that pervades the entire universe but evades any sort of detection. But hey, people used to think the sun revolved around the earth before there was a better explanation, so it's whatevs. Now there is always one small problem with the bullet cluster that has caused debate among scientists. In order for the production of x-rays in such a scenario, the clusters have to be traveling relative to each other between 2,000 to 4,700 kilometers per second, speeds that are unfeasible for such massive structures in our universe. For reference, our own Milky Way galaxy travels through the universe at 500 kilometers per second, many times slower than what has been supposed for the bullet cluster. All right, now get out of here. So once again, take the plot of dark matter, then place it where it would be relative to that if it had the opposite interaction. Get something like this. Now we add back the supposed x-rays. And would you look at that? Those aren't x-rays. Those are gamma rays. Which are a result when matter and antimatter annihilate. Red shifted down so much that they appear as x-rays to us here on Earth. Remember, not only is the red shift being caused by objects in the universe moving away from each other, but also huge invisible swarms of antimatter that decrease the potential energy of electromagnetic waves. Accounting for this would yield a higher frequency for the X-rays, resulting in gamma rays. Now, I don't have a supercomputer on hand, but it would look something like this. Boom. So right now you might be like, I looked up this gravitational interaction of antimatter, and I saw that it was under question. But I also saw, because it's the second result, matter and antimatter respond to gravity in the same way. The results of an experiment released on January 5th, 2022 by the CERN Antimatter Factory. A 16 parts per trillion measurement of the antiproton to proton charge mass ratio. I'm impressed. Not an easy feat. Also, 
Oh shit. I mean, if experiment shows that matter and antimatter respond to gravity in the same way, well, that blows a hole in this whole interpretation of general relativity I have. Sounds like I owe the antimatter factory a motorcycle. Should I be worried? Nah, I want to get a new bike anyway. I was thinking a Jixer. But if I get myself a Jixer right now, I'll be stuck with two bikes. Because all that experiment did was prove me right. Allow me to explain. So, no freefall experiment has ever been conducted for antimatter. It is technologically beyond our capabilities at the moment. And the test at CERN was no exception to this. The test that was conducted was a charge to mass ratio experiment. The charge to mass ratio of a charged particle causes it to osculate when present in a magnetic field. We learned this in Physics 102. Now, during this test, they reported that the rate of oscillations for both matter and antimatter were equal. And I have no objections there. After all, if I took a chunk of matter and a chunk of antimatter and I dropped them within the Earth's gravitational field, they would both accelerate at 9.8 meters per second squared. This would cause the oscillations to be the same, the rate of oscillations to be the same. Now, since one would fall down and one would fall up because one has negative mass, this would make the directions of the oscillations for matter and antimatter be opposite, one clockwise, one counterclockwise when present in a magnetic field. However, during this test, no such findings were reported. They were both seen to be going in the same direction. Well, Borchert et al., listen up because I'm about to explain. So in this experiment, a negatively charged hydrogen ion was used. That is, a hydrogen atom with one extra electron, resulting in a charge that's overall negative. Now we assume the mass to be positive. This gives us negative divided by positive, which equals a negative. Now, for this example, we'll assume the magnetic field to go in towards me. And we'll use the right-hand rule, since we're dealing with a negative charge, left-hand rule that would make the charge go like this. So, what did you see? Exactly that. Counterclockwise motion for the regular matter. Now, what about on the antimatter side? We have a negative charge, because it's an antiproton. That gives us a net charge of negative. Now, we have to decide what this mass is. If it's positive, then this would give us negative, and that would also result in a counterclockwise motion from your perspective. So, what did you see? That it was also traveling in a counterclockwise motion. Thus, you assume the mass to be positive. Negative divided by positive equals negative like this, both negative, both would go counterclockwise. However, that is not the case. The mass is negative. The sign is positive. Why? Because it is actually going clockwise. If you ask the proton, which direction are you traveling in? It would say I'm going counterclockwise. If you ask the antiproton what direction it was traveling in, it would say I'm traveling clockwise. Quod erat demonstrandum. So now any theory that predicts anti-gravitational properties for antimatter has to show why during pair production, an electron and a positron both oscillate in different directions, where they would both go in the same directions if for the, anti for the positron it had negative mass. This same concept applies. When viewed from the other side, it is spinning the other way. So whenever I'm like talking with my friends about black holes, they always decide to tell me what they actually think happens to something when it falls into a black hole. And by far my favorite three are, I think a black hole is just a really dark star. What if a black hole is just a remnant of an ancient civilization that made a jump into hyperspace? And what if black holes are where our souls go when we die? And all I gotta say to that is, you figured it out. Why didn't I think of that?
Other side of the fabric of space-time? I never believed it for a second. A black hole is just a really dark star left behind as a remnant from an ancient civilization that made a jump into hyperspace where our souls go when we die. I gotta redo this whole video. I gotta redo all my calculations. This is gonna take a while. I'll see you later. Mother All right, I think I finally figured it out. No! How'd you get that scar on your face? I lost the fight with a tree branch while filming the 2.5 dimensional visualization part of this video. If I prove you wrong, how do I get your motorcycle? And don't worry about that. You're not gonna prove me wrong. Einstein himself couldn't prove me wrong at this point, And I stand by that. It's gonna be you all versus me in the equations for gravitational time dilation and gravitational length contraction. This was over before it even began. And don't think for a second I'm gonna give you my bike or even change the title of this video if you can't explain away why that's mathematically predicting everything I've shown. It would be like you trying to bring a knife to a nuclear arms race. But let's say by some snowball's chance in hell, you pull a miracle out of your ass. How do you get that bike? Well, if you live in the greater metropolitan area, which greater metropolitan area? Do I even gotta say? I will deliver, I will drive that bike to you and give you the title for it. If you live anywhere else, I'm not paying for it to get delivered. However, I will mail you the title signed. Now you might be saying, well, this is not worth my time then if all I get is the title to a motorcycle and that motorcycle in a garage somewhere in New York. And all I gotta say to that is, don't worry, you were never gonna win it anyway. Why don't we see white holes? It. Why don't we see scarlet holes in the universe? And you have to remember, we're in a part of the universe where antimatter dominates regular matter by engulfing it. And all that antimatter is most likely just dust that wouldn't form into galaxies and stars and stuff. But our regular matter would be able to do that. Now. Very far away in the universe, there might be parts where the two roles are switched and regular matter engulfs galaxies of antimatter. And I personally believe that quasars, since they're so bright and so far away, are most likely supermassive scarlet holes. But don't quote me, boy, because I ain't said shit. Who are you? I'm just chilling. But you can call me Tom Don. How do I know everything you've claimed in this video is factually correct? Just Google it. Literally, Google anything I've said in this video. Hasn't antimatter been ruled out as a candidate for dark matter, since we would see a lot more gamma ray emissions if that were the case? Well, not if antimatter has anti-gravitational properties, then you wouldn't see much gamma ray emissions at all. You know, believe it or not, I actually figured all this out before you. And if you have proof that you've done it before June 17th, 2021, I will gladly concede to you. What if this video gets like 10 views and no one sees it, or just no one believes it, or just no one cares? And that would be fine. I would just go on living with my life like I wanted to do. Doesn't the concept of negative mass create runaway particles that could eventually run to the speed of light? And if you're looking at the Wikipedia page for negative masses, just know that that page, along with many other pages, needs to be updated. And I have not updated or edited any single public page on the internet. So the difference between the theory that involves runaway particles and my own interpretation of general relativity is that the runaway particle theory involves a negative mass that's on the same side of the fabric of space-time as our regular matter. Therefore, negative masses would repel each other while positive masses attract each other but would also attract negative masses. That would create a runaway effect where the positive mass is pulling in the negative mass while the negative mass is pushing away on the positive mass, therefore they would chase each other. And within this interpretation of general relativity, that is not what happens at all. What happens is that objects of negative mass are on one side of the fabric of space-time and they attract each other 
and they gravitationally repel objects that are on the other side. So instead of two objects chasing each other, they would just get pushed away. Objects on the same side attract, objects on opposite sides repel. So anything that hasn't been addressed in this video, and anybody brings up to me through comments, makes a response video, or even publishes it in a scientific journal, I will make another video as a response to all that, and I'll answer any other questions in that. And I don't know how many, if I make a second, a third one, a fourth one, I mean, this might just end up becoming my life, but whatever. Also the criteria for you to win that motorcycle would be either you would have to get your response to me published in a scientific journal or make a response video to me. I would love to go through every single comment on this video and every single person's dissenting opinion, but that would just be way too time consuming. So either a scientific journal or if you make a video, the criteria for that video, the only thing is that it has to have at least half the amount of views that this video has, because then otherwise I'm gonna be obligated to look at every single person's response to this, and that would just be way too time consuming. But know that I would really love to see anybody's um, dissenting opinion on this, so I can obliterate it. But um, Or anybody who's uh, well-known and respected in the physics community, if they have a response to this that gets brought to my attention in any way, I'll gladly respond to it. <laughs> if they want the bike, they can have it. But just know that if you live far away, you have to come pick up the bike yourself. Also, the offer is available until the day I die. All right, so how did I figure this out? And the answer is really simple, because I'm awesome. No, but seriously. Um, so about a year ago, I'm watching this video on YouTube called Intrinsic Curvature and Singularities. Obviously, a link is going to be in the description to it, because without that video, I would have never figured out black holes. Um, yeah, it's physics videos by Eugene Kudryansky. And before I move on, I have to say, Eugene, thank you. I'm going to acknowledge this teaching skill of yours. Of all those that have taught me things over the years, there is nobody that surpasses your ability to convey information. I, Tom Don, declare you the greatest teacher of them all. But seriously though, thank you. Okay, so in the video, Intrinsic Curvature and Singularities, I'm watching it and then uh, at the end of the video, it goes into the cone and how the cone's a point of uh, infinite curvature. And in that video, it's stated at the end, a point of infinite curvature, such as the one found on the tip of a cone, is an example of what we refer to as a singularity. And at that point, I'm like, what? Are you kidding me? Telling me the tip of a cone, the tip of a cone is by definition, the same thing as a black hole. And yeah, it is. And um, as of the date of this video, if you do try to look up where does a conical, where does a line drawn to a conical singularity lead to, you're going to get pictures like these. It, it would it would appear that nobody knows. It would appear that I'm also the first person to figure it out, obviously. So I'm like, okay, if tip of a cone is a point of infinite curvature resulting in a singularity, that's by definition the same exact thing that a black hole is. So I think to myself, okay, I should be able to figure out what's happening to some two-dimensional being that falls into the tip and then I should be able to draw an analogy to a black hole and therefore three-dimensional space. So I think really, so I built myself a cone like this one and um, I think really quickly I realized that, okay, it's going to the other side. It's the only place if, if a two-dimensional being falls into the tip, it's gotta go to the other side. And then I got stuck on that for three days because I'm like, what the hell does that mean? How the hell do I draw an analogy from that from a black hole and our three-dimensional universe. And then three days later, just boom, it just hit me like a 
train. I realized that the, on the other side would be dark matter per the resolution of the black hole information loss paradox. And also that if gravity protrudes in one side, then it does the opposite on the other. And that would be an anti-gravitational effect and that would explain dark energy. In that moment, right here, I was just like, it was the most surreal moment of my life. I was like, I just figured out black holes. I can't, I still get goosebumps sometimes when I think about that moment. June 17th, 2021. And um, after a minute, I was like, that was way too easy. That was way, 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 way too easy. You know, this has this has to be a theory somewhere, this other side of the fabric of space-time. So I ended up going online, looking up all the different theories on black holes, going through various websites, and it's all the usual BS of uh, parallel universes, maybe. Maybe there's a universe inside a black hole. Maybe it leads to a distant part of the our universe. And I was like, okay. No one has any idea what they're talking about. I'm the first person to figure out black holes. And, um, yeah, so then I, next thing I did was I looked at the equation for gravitational time dilation, realized what that was telling me, realized what that was telling us, us in the universe. Then a couple days later, I was having trouble with the singularity part, and then a couple days later, I figured out that part. Then I figured out the part that I told you I'm not telling you about, which I really would love to tell you about because it's awesome, but I need some sort of leverage in this video. And um, then I realized that it was, that dark matter was antimatter due to the parity inversion. And then, and then another thing I came across was the whole positron electron, how they both go in different directions and how the positron would go in the same direction if it had negative mass. Realized it was rotating the other way due to it being on the other side. Then I came across that experiment that said that antimatter has regular gravitational properties, almost had a heart attack. Then I read it and realized the same thing that's explaining the positron and the electron in the bubble chamber is the same thing that describes that. Then, then I figured out one of the most epic parts that I definitely cannot put in this video for the sake of leverage. But uh, it was a lot of mathematics. A lot of, went through a lot of papers figuring out that one. Good luck to anybody that wants to try to figure out that. Then, then the one part I was getting stuck at was I didn't know how to prove this for space. Yeah, I proved it for time. I was able to prove a lot of different things, but I couldn't prove, I didn't know how to prove it for space. And then right on cue, Eigen Chris uploads that video explaining the metric, and then I, I knew how to, I knew how to handle it, or at least I knew what to type into an integral calculator. Saw that the results were giving me, the uh, the correct predictions. And I was like, okay. So then after that, I was like, before that, I was ninety nine percent sure I had this figured out, and then after I proved it for space as well, I was like, or that I shown that it um that it's predicted for space. And I was like, okay, yeah, I, this is, I got this 100% figured out. And then, um, yeah, pretty much the rest is history. So thank you, Eugene. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Trevor, because it probably would have took me another 10 years if it wasn't for you bugging me to put this video out. Thank you, Trevor. But um, Yeah, that's it, that's the story. That's how I figured it out. You're welcome. But uh, as Newton said, or something along these lines, I couldn't see far if I wasn't standing on the shoulders of giants. So, um, yeah. Thanks for watching. Black hole solved. Mother. So consider this part bonus content, because unlike the rest of the things in this video, I'm unable to prove this without a fully quantized theory of gravity. I'm just going off intuition here. So don't worry about which side of the glass is which side of the fabric of space-time in this part. Just let this thing right here divide the two sides. So right now you might picture the proton and the electron on one side of the fabric of space-time 
and the antiproton and the positron on the other side. However, my intuition would tell me that objects on the same side should have the same charge. Objects on opposite sides should have opposite charges. That would mean gravitationally, when objects are on the same side, they attract. And when they're on opposite sides, they gravitationally repel. Objects on the same side electromagnetically repel. Objects on opposite sides electromagnetically attract. So this would put the proton and the positron on one side of the fabric of space-time and the antiproton and the electron on the other side of space-time. So obviously the electron is attracted to the proton and the positron is attracted to the antiproton. However, when they got close enough, even though they would be electromagnetically attracted, they would be gravitationally repelled. And that would explain why the electron doesn't crash into the proton, even though they have opposite charges. Peace out.